acephysics.org, math and physics tutoring with Dr. Hudis. I'm going to tell you from the beginning how the dilution refrigerator works. I knew nothing about it at the beginning of the summer, so I'm going to try to go through my series of thoughts as, as how it works. All, all, everything came from this chapter, but I put it together in my own, kind of my own way. Okay, so now I'm going to go on and explain how the dilution refrigerator works, starting from the beginning. So the first thing we need to know is some properties of helium. So helium is never solid at low pressure. If you have helium, helium atom has a very low, um, it, it has a very weak dipole moment. There's no static dipole moment. So if you take helium and put it near another helium, there will be a dipole interaction, but a very, very weak dipole interaction. And there's helium-3 and helium-4. They both have the same van der Waals dipole interaction. These are two different isotopes of helium. Helium-3 has one neutron in the nucleus. Helium-4 has two neutrons in the nucleus. And the key point is that there's um, a zero point energy. So a zero point energy is h bar squared over 8 ma squared. That's like the ground state energy in a, for a particle in a box. And if you notice, this goes as 1 over n. And so a zero point energy, if you have a particle of very low temperature, no matter how cold it gets, it's still going to be vibrating back and forth based on this zero point energy. And the zero point energy is bigger for smaller masses. So so helium can never become a solid because even if you take out all of its, if you remove all the temperature from it, if you have these helium atoms, they're going to be vibrating back and forth so much that they can't form a solid. And helium melts under its own zero point energy. Yeah. So the zero point energy gives rise to a zero point vibrational amplitude. You can just think of these atoms as vibrating. And it's about one third of the mean separation of the atom in the liquid helium state. And also, if you notice, the mass of helium-3 is smaller than the mass of helium-4. Therefore, helium-3 is going to have a bigger zero-point energy than helium-4. And so for that reason, for the same reason that it's vibrating, helium-3 is going to have a lower boiling temperature, a smaller density, and a smaller latent heat, and a larger vapor pressure, all for, for the reason that it has a bigger zero-point energy. Okay. All right, so this is a quick slide. So um, this is just kind of similar to what I was saying on the last page. Here's the melting point and the boiling point of different um, atoms. And if you, you can see the liquid helium-3 and helium-4, they're always liquid they change from a liquid to a vapor. Helium-4 does at 4.2 Kelvin, and helium-3 does at 3.2 Kelvin if you're at one atmosphere of pressure. And that's, that's all I have to say about this slide. You can stop me at any point and ask questions and so on. All right, so on this page, what I have is the phase diagram for helium-4 and the phase diagram for helium-3, pressure versus temperature. So this is the phase diagram for helium-4. It's a liquid in this area. And once you get less than 2 degrees, less than 2.17 Kelvin, it turns into a superfluid. This is going to be important to talk. And what this means, helium-4, it's a boson. So the helium-4, when you get really cold, if you have a container of helium-4, if you start to cool it down a lot, it's all going to Bose condense. So all the helium-4 will start moving into the same energy state, into the same ground state. And so this is super fluid, it has low viscosity, no viscosity actually, and it's this special um, state of matter. But why is it a boson? It's a boson because there are four uh, nucleons in the nucleus. There's two protons and two neutrons, and their, their spins add up to, to zero. And then you have two electrons, the two electrons spin add up to zero. Um, helium-3 is a fermion because it has one less neutron in the nucleus. And because it's a fermion, um, you can see the scale here is much different. This is about 2.17 Kelvin when it goes into a superfluid for helium-4. Helium-3 actually can make a superfluid transition, but that's at 10 to the negative 3 Kelvin. And it, it can do that um, by forming Cooper pairs. And so I, I put this here. I said it's superconducting helium-3. I've never seen it anywhere. I just put that there. But the point is, helium, this is not important, but it's interesting. Helium-3 can also kind of Bose condense, even though it's a fermion. And it's because the helium-3 forms Cooper pairs these are the two phase diagrams. Here's where it goes from liquid to vapor. And those are the phase diagrams for helium. OK, so now I'm going to start out by talking about evaporative cooling. So one part of cooling, we're talking about refrigeration and cooling things down, is with evaporative cooling. So if you have liquid helium in a container with a vapor above the liquid helium, um, if this is a uh, 
this is at one atmosphere of pressure, the liquid helium is going to be at 4.2 Kelvin, because it's 4.2 Kelvin at one atmosphere of pressure. Now, if I started to put a pump on this vapor, and I started to pump away helium from this vapor phase, the liquid would cool down. The reason the liquid would cool down is because the helium would leave from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, would make a phase transition, and the hot helium atoms here would go into the vapor, and it would start to cool down, and so you can cool down the liquid helium-3 until it gets, liquid helium-4, until it gets to 1.3 Kelvin. You can't cool it down any more than that because the vapor pressure is just too small at that point. So now let's imagine that you have liquid helium-3 at 1.3 Kelvin with a vapor above it, and you put a sample here. This is something you want to cool down. You, you just touch the sample to the bottom. The sample is going to, if the sample is hotter than 1.3 Kelvin, heat is going to come from this, from this sample. The sample is going to cool, and the heat is going to cause liquid. It's not going to increase the temperature of the liquid helium. It's just going to cause the liquid helium to change phase. There's a, um, a heat of vaporization. And so the heat will go in and cause the liquid helium to change phase. So what I have here, I say if a hot sample is in contact with a 1.3 Kelvin helium bath, the sample will cool down by giving off heat to the liquid helium. The heat input goes to changing the phase, not the temperature. And there's something called cooling power. And cooling power is the amount of heat per time that you can remove from a sample. So I can remove a certain amount of heat per second. The, heat, the units are watts. And so cooling power is Q dot, it's heat per time. And it's equal to N dot. N dot is the number of helium atoms that pass this phase boundary. So if there were like five that passed here per second, and that would be five, because that's five per second. And then it's time for the change in enthalpy. And, um, and you can say that, so the heating power is just equal to n dot times L, where L is the latent heat of vaporization, and n dot is the number of particles that pass through the phase boundary. So um, this is an example of an evaporation refrigerator. This is not a dilution refrigerator. I'm going to get to, you need to know how the evaporation refrigeration works in order to get to the dilution refrigerator. But this is a, a evaporation refrigerator in practice. And so what this is, it has an outside, I guess you need a jacket of liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin. And then there's a vacuum chamber inside here. It's like a shield, like a thermos shield. So here's going, here's a pump which just keeps this chamber evacuated. And then there's a, um, a small container which has liquid helium-4. The same helium is here, but now you have a much smaller pressure. So the inside is where you do your evaporative cooling. So there'd be a sample here and the sample would give heat to this helium-4. The helium-4 would vaporize, and, and the, that would produce this heating, and not okay. help. So vapor pressure, this is the end result of the slide. Um, here's the Clausius factor on equation. And so um, the pressure, the PDT, the vapor pressure, the derivative of respect to time, is equal to the entropy of the gas minus the entropy of the liquid. Divided by the molar volume of the gas minus the molar volume of the liquid. This is just entropy is Q over T, so this is just L over T. You can um, ignore the mass of liquid with respect to the gas. It's easy to get to this differential equation. And the key point is that the vapor pressure for a liquid is E to the negative latent heat of vaporization for that liquid divided by RT, where R is the gas constant and T is the temperature. So as you get to it, it drops exponentially as you get to low temperature. So when you get to very low temperature, you have an exponentially less vapor pressure above a liquid. All right, so for helium-3 and helium-4, these are the vapor pressure for helium-3 and the vapor pressure for helium-4. This is on a log log plot. And as you notice, at a given temperature, helium-4 always has a higher... So now we're going to move on to how the dilution refrigerator works. So. Um, imagine this is a thought experiment, or a Duncan experiment. Or... Imagine that you have a layer of helium-3 sitting on top of a layer of helium-4. We have a container, and just imagine at t equals zero, there's a layer of, first there's a layer, you can see right here. Don't forget these arrows here. Just imagine this is helium-4 on bottom, it's more dense, and helium-3 is on top. And then if you just start time at that point, what's going to happen? And what happens is, Helium-3 will start diffusing into the helium-4, and it's actually making a phase change from, you call this the concentrated, um, the concentrated phase, because this is all helium-3, and the dilute phase, because this is mainly helium-4 diluted with some helium-3. And so why is it that helium-3 is going to start to dilute into here? And here's the reason. So helium-3 has a bigger zero-point energy 
than helium-4. We said that before because helium-3 is less mass and zero point energy goes as one over m. So helium-3 is moving over a bigger volume than helium-4 is. So here, helium-3 and helium-3 are attracted by a dipole force, but if this helium-3 moves into the helium-4 environment, it's going to have a stronger binding force because it's going to be closer to the helium-4 than it was to the helium-3 up above. So there's a stronger binding force here. However, helium-3 is a fermion, and the Fermi temperature is 1 Kelvin. So as the helium-3 starts moving in here, it has to fill up successively higher Fermi energies. And so the first helium-3 that diffuses through here, it's going to have a stronger binding energy than it did in, the helium four, in, in its own helium-3 environment. The next helium-3 that diffuses is going to have to be at a slightly higher energy level because you know, no two fermions can have the same set of quantum numbers. So the energies are just going to keep getting higher and higher. And this is going from lower chemical potential to higher chemical potential. But as more and more helium-3 diffuses in, you're going to be getting to a point where the chemical potential of both phases is the same. And at t equals zero, that works out to be 6.6%. So, so the Fermi energy of helium-3 is about 1 Kelvin? Yes. At uh, relatively high temperature, then the um, the KT would be comparable to the Fermi energy. Let's say uh, one Kelvin. If the pot is sitting at one Kelvin, right? Okay. Then you're going to have KT comparable to uh, the Fermi energy. Okay. In that case, the the Fermi Dirac distribution is going to be really broad. Broad. In this picture, you don't really care about um, what's happening in the concentrated phase. It is how the helium-3 atoms uh, occupy states in the dilute phase. Uh -huh. All right. Uh -huh. At zero temperature, yes. If you go to At higher zero temperature, yeah. Okay. So this is. Oh, okay, so this is really a, a zero temperature picture. This is or 0.05 Kelvin, something way much smaller than one. Yes. So this is absolutely a zero temperature. So it, is it, at, it is at a temperature much smaller than the for Fermi sure. temperature of the helium. Yeah, this, this is a thought experiment right. for that reason. So, and the whole point of this slide is at zero temperature, if you had these two phases sitting here, you would have 100% helium 3 sitting on top of helium-4 with 6.6% helium-3 mixed inside there, even at zero temperature, and that's a very important point for how this whole thing works. So that, that's the, is that the reason why I should know this, uh, I should remember this, I should say, that's why the phase separation happens at, when you get down to a sudden temperature, we're jumping a little bit ahead. So your mixture, the phase separation of, of, of the concentrated phase and the dilute phase, that happens when the mixture goes below a certain temperature. Oh yeah, I have the phase diagram on two slides. Right. On two slides. This is the phase diagram for a, a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. So what we have here, imagine you have a container and you dump in some helium-3 and some helium-4 in the container. This down here tells you how much helium-3 there is. So this is a 25% helium-3. You have a container with 25% helium-3, 75% helium-4. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this mixture of two things, and this is the phase diagram for the mixture. So imagine that we start here at point A. If you start at point A, you're going to be in a relatively high entropy state. It's going to be a normal liquid. You're just going to have helium-3 and helium-4 in the container, all spread out, moving around just like a liquid. As you move the temperature, so as you go down in temperature, so now you have this container, you start decreasing, removing heat from it, and going down in temperature, once you pass this lambda line, all the helium-4 atoms start to Bose condense, and you get into a superfluid phase. Keep going down, you're getting more and more of the helium-4 to Bose condense, and then once you get to this point, this is where you get a phase separation, where you're gonna have, once you hit this point here, there's gonna be a, an actual separation of helium-3 sitting on top of helium-4. That makes sense, because that's a lower entropy state. Things are gonna separate out. And the way that this works, let's say we go to point B. So what's it going to look like at point B? So you go in this direction, you hit this point here, and that point's going to be like 8%. So that says that the lower phase is going to be 8% helium-3 in the helium-4 environment. And then on top, if you come over this point, maybe you would get like 92% or something. So the top phase is going to have um, 
92% helium-3 and 8% helium-4. There's, there's actually a physical separation of the two things. And if you notice, once you get to absolute zero, no matter what concentration of helium-3 you have, you're always going to get 6.6% in the lower phase and 100%. Change in chemical P is heat. So here, if you have water, and water goes from a liquid to the vapor phase, when one water, so there's two pictures. I'm looking at this picture right here. When one mo water molecule moves from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, so this water molecule goes from here to here and undergoes a phase change, and the change in enthalpy is positive, and that means that it's en endothermic. If the change in enthalpy is positive, what that means is endothermic and you have to supply heat. So if you supply heat, the water molecule moves from here to here, and I think of that as kind of like the, the bonds breaking between the, um, the hydrogen bonding. Now, if you, in analogy to this, here's a concentrated phase of helium-3 in a dilute phase with mainly helium-4 and some helium-3. And so, in a, very analogous, you can say when one helium-3 atom moves from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase of the mixing chamber, so we're saying the helium-3 is moving from here to here, the change in enthalpy of the system is positive, and it's an endothermic change. So if you add heat to this thing, a helium-3 atom will move from here to here, and I tried pretty hard, but I cannot picture how that energy works out in the same way as like breaking a bond here. It's really difficult for me to picture that. But I understand, though, if you add heat, the helium-3 moves across the phase boundary. And that's just, that's very similar processes. All right, so at the end of the day, these are the formulas for cooling power. But let me very briefly explain. We've already seen cooling power for evaporative refrigerator. Here's the formula for the cooling power for the dilution refrigerator, and I'm going to talk about this. I just want to discuss how the book says that they derived it. So the whole point is, so you have the two phases. Now we're talking about the two phases. There's the upper phase of helium-3, the lower phase of helium-4. Helium-4 begins to boast condense at 2.177 Kelvin. And we're looking at all this stuff at like 0.05 Kelvin. So whenever you're less than 0.5 Kelvin, the liquid helium-4 is almost totally Bose condensed, and it forms an inert background. It's like, so if you, maybe I should go back to that one picture for a second. Yeah. So this is at such a cold temperature that this is mainly helium-4, but all the helium-4 is Bose condensed, and it's like, it's almost like it doesn't exist. All the, it doesn't even change the specific heat. It doesn't do anything except for increase the mass of the helium-3 that goes from this phase to this phase. There's an effective mass increase. Um, and, uh, and so the key point is that by treating the helium atoms like conduction electrons in the metal, you can get an equation for the specific heat of the two phases. So helium is a fermion. You can treat it exactly like conduction electrons in a metal. And so the conduction electrons in a the metal, they all have a specific heat, which varies linearly with temperature. And the only difference between the helium in the upper phase and the lower phase is a difference in mass. Uh, the Fermi temperature for metal is like 10,000 degrees. Here, the Fermi temperature is 1. But it, it's, it's a nice analogy there. And so you can compute the specific heat. And once you know the specific heat between the two phases, you can then get cooling power. At the end of the day, this is the formula for cooling power. And it comes from treating the helium-3 like the electrons in a metal. And so the cooling power is the amount of power that can be, the amount of heat that can be removed from a sample per time. So the cooling power for a dilution refrigerator is just a number 84 times n dot 3, so that's the number of helium-3 particles that are passing the phase boundary per time, times T squared. But again, this is valid only when T is much smaller than Tf. Yes. 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 And the cooling power for evaporative refrigerator, we've already seen this earlier, is n dot f. The problem with this is, um, when you get to very small pressures, n dot is the number of particles that make this transition, and at very small um, temperature, the pressure is almost zero, and so you can't get you can't get anything changing phase when you're very small. When you're very small temperature, there's such little vapor pressure that evaporative cooling won't work. But no matter what temperature you get to, there's always going to be the five percent or six point six percent helium three in the helium four environment, and so p squared is much better than that. And so you can get cooler with a dilution refrigerator. Well, ho hopefully this will help make sense of what's going on here. So this is one cycle of the dilution refrigerator. So this is the actual, I have one more page with a better picture, but here's kind of what a dilution, this is exactly what a dilution refrigerator is. Here's the mixing chamber. 
you have 6.6% helium-3, 100% helium-3. And I haven't talked about it, but I'm going to tell you now, there's something called a still. So there's a pipe which goes down into the 6.6% phase, and you set up a still right here with a heater on it, and you keep this at 0.07 Kelvin. And the reason that you do that is because at 0.07 Kelvin, the vapor pressure, this is a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, but the vapor pressure of helium-3 is always bigger than the vapor pressure of helium-4. So this, the vapor here is mainly, at this temperature, the vapor is mainly helium-3. And so in this situation, let's say that you put some heat here. So you heat this up, then a helium-3 atom moves from here to here. And then, because you have the still set up here, all these threes I put here, these are supposed to be helium-3s that I didn't do a very good picture of. Here's all the helium threes in this helium four environment down here, and you, their concentration gets less as you move towards this area. And as you move up here, the concentration gets smaller and smaller. You set it up that way. That's why you keep this at 0.7 degrees. So there's an osmotic pressure. There's a the helium three is going to want to go to an area of less concentration and fill it up. So these helium threes will start pushing in this direction, and then they'll get sucked up this tube and they'll come up to the tube and then come out the tube and then it makes a complete in this cycle. Picture you can see there's heat flow here and so there's a very important thing called the heat exchanger. So again, here is the concentrated phase of helium-3 and the dilute phase and you have a pipe going into the dilute phase and then one going into the concentrated phase. So the helium-3 is going to go in here, they come up in this pipe and it's going to go through all these circles and come out this side and go to the still. But then there's helium-3, it's a complete cycle, which goes in the outer pipe. And the whole point is that this is exchanging heat between the helium-3 coming in and the helium-3 going out. Because you want all the helium-3 that enters here to be at around 0.05 Kelvin, which is the temperature of the mixing chamber. And so as this comes, as this comes in, it's going to be coming in at 0.7 Kelvin. And so the stuff on the outside is going to be getting continually cooler and cooler as it moves through and the helium-3 on the inside is getting continually hotter and hotter because you want to use all of the heat of vaporization to cool your sample and not to cool the helium-3 and the helium-4 coming out. Not fun. Okay, we're almost done. So here is the whole thing in all its glory. So here is the dilution refrigerator. Right here is a 1K pot, pot and this is just and evaporative cooling. This is one refrigerator, which is simply helium-4, and it's evaporative cooling. So there's just helium-4 coming in. It actually doesn't make a full cycle. Helium-4 comes in, it evaporates, and then it leaves. And so this is one refrigerator. Here is the dilution refrigerator. So you have a sample down here. If you sample gives some heat to the mixing chamber, which is a 0.05 degree Kelvin, that heat causes the helium-3 to make a phase change from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase. There is then a osmotic pressure which pushes the, hel the hot helium-3 that came through into this tube. The helium-3 goes up. It goes through a continuous um, heat exchanger, and so it's going to get hotter. It's going to come up here and get hotter and hotter. It's going to go into the still at 0.7 Kelvin. Once it's in the still, it makes another phase change from liquid to vapor. This cools down a little bit because of evaporative feelings heating, so then you have to heat the still up, there's a little heater there. Then the helium-3 comes up here, goes outside, goes through a nitrogen trap, comes around, it's at room temperature, it comes in, this is at 1.3 Kelvin, so it passes through this, it leaves this at 1.3 Kelvin, goes into the still at 0.7 Kelvin, it goes into all of the heat exchangers, then it ends up in the top layer of that. I'm in the dilution refrigerator lab. This is the lab I spend a lot of my time in, about half my time. Uh, right now there's two people who work in this lab. There's a graduate student who's more senior than I am. He's about to leave and then there's me and we're the only two people who work in here. The only two people who have keys for this lab. So as you can see, here's the lab space. Um, this is actually the dilution refrigerator here. There's the top of it. Right now it's on the crane. The actual mixing chamber and all the refrigerator parts are inside of here. Um, I think this is probably, yeah, so this is just, um, it's just sealed off right now. This would all be covered with 
helium, so there'd be liquid helium, and then outside the liquid helium, you'd have a, uh, a vacuum. And so those are all the parts of the refrigerator. Most of the parts of the refrigerator are covered up right now. This is the cryostat. Here's the cryostat where this refrigerator, it gets loaded into the top of the cryostat right there. And then you take the cryostat and you move the cryostat into the shielding room. So right here we're going into the shielding room. It's dark in here, so I don't know how well you can see inside there, but here's the shielding room, the cryostat. I have my here. iPhone and um, I just want to show you what the refrigerator looks like when it's inside the shielding room. So right now we're running an experiment. We're doing a hull measurement. There's a high magnetic field on. And um, there's a sample inside the loose refrigerator. It's running the refrigerator right now. The mixing chamber is at about 0 0.05 Kelvin, a little bit less than that. Here's the cryostat. This is a door which has liquid helium. Inside here, there's liquid helium at 4.2 Kelvin. This is a gas container of gas helium-4, just at room temperature. And as you can see, there are all the pumping lines are connected. This is the main pumping line. And um, that's uh, what's going on right now. And there's a magnetic field inside the chamber. And the magnetic field um, is going, and it's the magnetic field is on our sample. And as the magnetic field is on our sample, we're sending the current through and measuring the hull voltage because that's the experiment that we're doing at this time. And the reason that I'm in the lab right now is because I need to change. You can see it's very noisy here because we have a very expensive helium-3 pump and then we have a not so expensive helium-4 pump. And this is the magnetic field. So right now the magnetic field is at 6.9 Tesla and it's going to a set point of 8 Tesla. And so once it gets to 8 Tesla, I have to change the polarity and bring it down to negative 8 Tesla. Hi, I'm Dr. Jacob Hudis, and I offer online AP Physics test prep classes. I offer two classes for AP Physics C, one for mechanics and one for electricity and magnetism. I also offer two classes for the algebra AP Physics test, one and two. I also offer online modern physics classes for high school students, college students, and lifelong learners. Please go to my website, acephysics.org, to find out more.